Hi, my name is Wendy Olson and I'm working in a team at the University of Manchester on embedding good quantitative methods training into substantive classrooms in social science. Our basic idea is to try and encourage people to scaffold the students upward into better abilities and a, a higher proficiency with using quantitative data. Now, if you were in a methods classroom and you wanted to do scaffolding, you would probably have a lower lecturing component and a higher component of activities in that classroom. So with my other colleagues at the Researcher Development Initiative, which is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council of the United Kingdom, we've been actually developing examples of sets of activities, um, how we would record lectures and have them canned for use uh, later. We're trying to actually demonstrate how we can have better learning methods in, this, in the methods classroom in social science. So I'm going to go through a few specific points about that. Um, one of the specific points is, is actually what scaffolding is. I've got an image here that shows how we build upward from one set of skills to another and another. So it's sort of building blocks of learning. And you could think, well, the statistical knowledge or the ability to interpret numbers is one part of the skill. But interpreting that and becoming able to actually produce those sorts of numbers, it would be an even stronger skill for social science. And the government is funding a set of 20 projects because they really want more British social scientists to be able to become users of data and, and critical interpreters of data. So if you look at the PowerPoint slides attached to this video on our website for the Researcher Development Initiative, you'll actually be able to see how we advocate that the scaffolding operates, because it's not from being non-mathematical to being very mathematical. It's not that. It's having your math embedded into becoming a really expert social scientist. So I'm going to say a few more words in detail about this scaffolding method. You have the same learning outcomes, but the methods are different. You're not delivering the material to students. They can get that in a, in a textbook, and they are bored if you try and deliver it. So instead, you're getting students to practice. You're motivating them to do practice, practice, practice. And many lecturers know this and prepare workbooks for students. But the workbook approach with short answers tends to imply that the answers are yes, no, true, false, that answers in quantitative methods are always either wrong or right. And this is a threatening situation for students. Many non-quantitative students begin to feel defensive. They think, oh, I've got it wrong, and I'm embarrassed, and I don't want to embarrass myself. But if they practice getting it wrong in the classroom, and they get encouraged to just try again, try again, try again, and then they'll, they'll be more encouraged to try and use data more intensively. And what I mean by using it intensively isn't doing something mathematical with the data. At the undergraduate level in social science, we want them to discuss the data comfortably. We want a group of four students to have two or three competing interpretations of the data. We could have them speculate and explore what possible things in society could have caused these differentiated outcomes. And this is uh, actually contestations of the interpretation, and that is a very advanced skill. That would be a year three skill, or perhaps a distinction level in the undergraduate year one. So contestation is valuable. and. Um, the idea of reinterpretation. So I've, I've covered a number of aspects of scaffolding, and now I want to think about how you as a lecturer can be more sophisticated in the way you plan and structure your course. The whole course syllabus needs to offer some lecturing material. You can do MP3 podcasts, or you can do Camtasia. I've got a sample here of how you can have the slides showing and the MP3 sound, and students can view that anytime over the, uh, the internet or an iPad. I'll just show you Camtasia briefly. Here it's showing a really interesting histogram. And if I set the Camtasia running, it runs the lecture. And you'll see the mouse moving as it moved when I presented that lecture. Now using Camtasia, you don't present it again. You tell students that lecture is available in your virtual learning environment, and you'll be able to, to review it any time. They can then move around the lecture. They can look at the tables, they can look at the very basics at the beginning of the lecture, and then they can look again at what, in this case, what I have is a professional article from the medical, actual medical literature about the study of hearing difficulties. And they can see the, the kind of diagrams being used in a professional academic context. This is a peer-reviewed journal article. So for an undergraduate, just learning about that is one of the learning outcomes. So I think we begin to, to be able to differentiate for a given um, lecture, when you meet a whole large group of students, we begin to dif differentiate the substantive learning outcomes, which we should be explicit about. So knowing how people with hearing problems are suffering from discrimination in the labor market, that's substantive. But also we have empirical learning outcomes, so knowing how to interpret a histogram about differences between a minority group versus a majority group. 
um, or a, a bar chart or the other kinds of diagrams that I was showing there. So we'd like to encourage um, sociology and politics lecturers and others in social science to integrate the quantitative methods into the actual learning experience for the students. Thank you.